good afternoon everyone so this is our first graduate students town hall so thank you very much all the panelists to join today and so uh, i let uh, uh, sam later on explain the process in terms of asking questions and uh, moving the uh, discussion forward but the way it is uh, i let me introduce the uh, uh, my panelists first and then i will uh, take few minutes to explain where we are in terms of the grad st uh, studies in our school, what kind of decisions we are taking during this COVID situation. And then I'll uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Jacobi, who's the Dean of College of Graduate Studies to talk a little bit about uh, her portfolio, what's going on in the College of Graduate Studies uh, and the challenges we are facing in terms of COVID situation. Then I will talk to our Associate Director for Graduate Studies, Dr. Uh, Lucas later on and also our MNG coordinator, uh, Dr. Rudy S.C. Taylor. And uh, today we also have Dr. Bickler with us, who is uh, uh, so uh, as an associate director for our in, uh, research and industry partnership. So let me go one by one and I'll say your name and please take one or two minutes to tell what, what you do and then I will start the process. So, um, okay, on my screen, uh, Dr. Bickler is on the right, so I'll start from there. All right, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lucas Bickler, and I'm part of the mechanical engineering group or mechanical engineering faculty. And I also serve as the associate director for the School of Engineering, looking after research and industrial partnership uh, partnerships. And during the past few months, I have been involved in essentially coming up with procedures and protocols for how do we deal with research and coming back to the research labs and restarting research on our campus. And I'll speak to that in, in just a little bit. Thanks, Lucas. So uh, Dr. Klukas. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Richard Klukas, and I think most of you know that I'm the Associate Director of Graduate Studies, so I take care of all things pertaining to graduate studies in the School of Engineering. And uh, I will talk to you a little bit about, uh, or give you a little bit of a, an idea of what we've been doing in light of COVID-19 to make sure that all of the activities that graduate students need to do continue on. Thanks, Richard. Dr. Jacoby. Thank you. It's wonderful to join the group here in engineering this afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity. My name is Jen Jacoby. I'm the Dean Pro Tem in the College of Graduate Studies. Um, my faculty appointment is within Faculty of Health and Social Development. Today, I'm here to address any questions and hopefully offer some insight to students as to the current state where we're at with COVID and your learning experiences here at UBCO, as well as questions that I might be able to address for the fall. Thank you to the students for taking time this afternoon to join us. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, now, Dr. C. Taylor. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Rudy Seithala. I'm also a faculty member. Rudy, your voice is not very loud. Okay, I'll try again. Yeah, that's better. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rudy Seithala. I am a faculty member in mechanical engineering and I am the um, uh, MNG coordinator. And I would be uh, answering questions uh, regarding uh, how the program is going to be continuing in the fall. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we have with us uh, Sam and Shannon, who are behind the scene doing everything. And I will let Sh Sam to explain a little bit to Q&A once I finish. And then we, uh, I, I request my other panelists to talk about it. So first, first thing is, welcome, everyone. Uh, so I see the numbers are close to 45 participants today. So I'm glad that some of you came uh, and joined today, even on the, the short notice. I think it's very important. Uh, we, as you can imagine, as uh, the world is, has been in turmoil like everyone else, we, are, uh, we try to adapt to the situation. And, uh, and kudos to everyone who, uh, on the administration side, at the faculty staff side and staff, as well as the students. As many of you are international students, stay uh, away from your families, a lot of anxieties and uh, stress, I can imagine, for, uh, for, for all of you, and I know I have my own graduate students who are going through the same process of social isolation and uh, staying at homes. So there's a huge challenge for all of us. So I just, uh, the purpose of today's uh, town hall is to give you a, a latest what's going on in the school and how we can impact and what our plans 
and how we can assist you. So we'll be really appreciate uh, your feedback as well. What uh, and but uh, but you can imagine there are so many things unknown at this point, uh, and we cannot make many decisions as well. So we are learning on the way and making some decisions. So one of the biggest challenge for us when uh, this COVID-19 hit and we uh, the university closed down in 15th of March, I believe, two and a half months back, uh, it was in a kind of an it was an emergency situation. We didn't plan for it. So, but uh, I'm very glad to report that we somehow uh, able to pull it. The whole university able to pull it uh, in terms of delivering our courses and making sure that we have been in touch with our students and trying to find a way to uh, help everyone. You can imagine the scale of the issue where students are stuck in different countries, not only graduate students, but undergrad students. There is so much anxiety around it. And uh, so we try to address those issues as much as possible. So making sure that safety and security of the students uh, and everybody uh, from the UBC, staff, faculty, everybody safe and healthy. That's a, the that's a bottom line. So that is, a, I would say, guiding principle for us in terms of making any decision making. Uh, so we have done it uh, uh, in this process. Some people were really frustrated because of the situation, but, but we tried our best. We tried to have a, as many town halls and communication as possible uh, during this process, but uh, some of in, in few thing, in, in few issues, uh, we have seen that. Uh, uh, Communication is one thing which is never enough. Uh, we need to keep on doing it, making sure that the messages are delivered and people will understand. So during this process, uh, we have to bend many rules, I would say, which we, in normal circumstances, we will never able to do it. Uh, you can imagine so many of the comprehensive exam, we have done it and already happening. Many of you have maybe going through it. Uh, PhD defenses, master defenses uh, and uh, committee meetings, Many of these things which were never been possible before or nobody could have imagined in the wildest dream, we have were able to pull it uh, uh, during this. And uh, But one thing which we have tried all in all cases that keeping students as a, our priority, making sure that students who are uh, uh, somehow affected if, because of this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, I can give, I would like to give you a few examples which you can understand the scale of the problem. Uh, as you know that uh, engineering is, uh, in our case, we uh, work with industry and most of our stu graduate students, especially research students I'm talking here, whether masters or PhD, they are, uh, their fundings are coming from the industry and industry is in a deep problem, in a deep uh, uh, problem or, uh, or kind, I would say quagmire in that situation of a, having a short in cash flow. And how we can make sure that the funding flow that so if you ask me where I spend my time, this is what I do. I uh, uh, making sure that uh, those partners stay in, intact, the person uh, partners stay intact. It means the funding is flowing and that funding is basically underflowing to the grad students. So that is a big challenge for us, making sure we will do it. The other biggest challenge which we have uh, been trying to address and keep on working, making I don't know how many task forces recently, just to how to be deliver our courses. Uh, so as you remember, initially when we took a decision uh, uh, in 15th of March, the idea was that we maybe situation will be better in a few weeks time, we'll be back in, back in business in summer. But as you see, as the time passes, and the decisions has been made for summer one, summer two, now for fall, that majority of things will be on, on online. So, and so you can see that it's an it's a evolving situation and we are making sure that we address to the needs as the new, the new crisis or new uh, information is available to us. So we have addressed that. One thing which is very uh, much related to uh, our grad students, uh, which we have trying to do because of the change of format in terms of online teaching, uh, as you, many of you are involved in our tutorials and TAs and marking, your engagement will be look, will look different. And you must have experience already in the last semester or already experiencing in the summer semester. We are trying to provide more resources to it. Uh, and those resources, the idea is that, uh, because on one hand, there is a vulnerability around student funding. On the other hand, it's a it's a making sure that uh, that we can address the needs of our undergrad students so uh, in a really professional manner. We try to do both things together 
So uh, what we have done just before this at town hall, we were discussing about the potential uh, increase in the TA budget and uh, tutorial. We are expecting this year we will be increasing it uh, by 20 to 25 percent of the budget in terms of TA, which will this that uh, funding will trickle down to our students. This is for grad students funding. So uh, and we try to address this thing. So many of you will be see that um, they'll be coming your way. So that is just an example. I would wanted to bring it here. And so at this point, you know, I, I don't want to go too much detail. I want to uh, uh, keep some time for question and answer in the end. And we have some panels who would, uh, a panelist who would like to talk on very specific issues. So I will go and request Dr. Jacoby to talk a little bit what's going on in Cox at this point and, uh, uh, and give some uh, bigger picture to all the students so they can understand uh, where we are and what, uh, what we are planning to do in, uh, in fall. Dr. Jacoby. Thanks, Dr. Sadiq. Um, it's wonderful to be here and give uh, some students some indication of what we're doing in COGS and, and find out perhaps from you other ways that we can support you in your academic journey. Our number one concern moving forward is just that, your academic progress and how to support you and your knowledge growth within that. So I'm going to encourage you all to check the COGS COVID-19 website. It gets updated quite regularly, and in the next few weeks, you're going to see a huge change in that website as we're working to support you not only in the summer term, but in the fall term. So there'll be a lot of additional resources posted there. For generic questions, I encourage you to work with your faculty supervisor, work with the program advisors within engineering, as well as work with us in COGS through our Grad Ask portal. You can send questions there and they will re be responded to. As well, you're, you're more than welcome to email myself or Associate Dean Paul Shipley, and we'll get back to you on, on questions that potentially you don't want the unknown person to read because they might be more personal or concerning to yourself. So please, if there's ways that we can help you, reach out to us. We're here to support and help your knowledge growth. The other element that I want to talk about today, which resonates a lot with students and Dr. Sadiq already identified as finances. We continue to advocate quite strongly to senior executive across both campuses in collaboration with graduate and postdoctoral um, studies, which is the equivalent of COGS on the Vancouver campus, as well as student leaders to find ways to find additional financial resources for you. One of the successes we had is the delay in your summer fees. So summer fees are not due until June 15th. It's not a huge success. I'm certain many of you would prefer not to pay any fees. Um, it's a wonderful thing not to have to pay fees, but at Canadian institutions, I don't think there's any institution that supports that even beyond a COVID context. So we continue to work for ways to support you in that tuition relief element. In that regard, um, immediately upon the COVID situation or short thereafter, there was a bursary opportunity. We've continued to grow. What I suggest, uh, let's, uh, Richard, you go ahead. And then when Jennifer, Jennifer joins, then she can complete her uh, uh, part. Okay, very good. Uh, I'll be relatively brief. Uh, as Dr. Sadiq mentioned, when the COVID pandemic struck two and a half months ago, uh, we have been surprisingly successful in terms of keeping business running pretty much as usual, not quite. Uh, so I just want to uh, briefly address the major components of, of, of a graduate student's program. Number one courses, of course, last term we were able to finish off the, the courses online. In, all summer courses are being taught online. And uh, at this point in time, we know that the vast majority of the courses in the fall, so those courses starting in September, will also be offered online. There may be uh, a few exceptions depending on particular circumstances in a course where the course will be offered in person, but the vast majority will be offered online. All of the graduate courses that were originally scheduled to be taught in September will still go ahead. Uh, at least at this point in time, that's my information. So courses will proceed, but online. In terms of um, defenses, PhD, comprehensive and proposal exams, uh, the College of Graduate Studies reacted very quickly to, to the pandemic and 
uh, allowed all of those defenses and PhD comprehensive or proposal exams to be conducted 100% online. And that's what's been going on for the last two and a half months. And uh, it's, been, it's been working very well. So we're very, we're very happy about that. We're very pleased that defenses can go on. Uh, despite the fact that they are 100% online. The experience is not exactly the same as in person, but uh, I think we are still making sure that the, the purpose of the defense is being fulfilled. So that's going on. In terms of everyday administrative type of functions, forms, uh, you know, uh, requests for course transfers, requests for leaves of absence, all those kind of things that, uh, that come up in a student's life, uh, Shannon Hole, our administrative assistant, has been working uh, from home for the last two months and uh, that has worked uh, very well also, uh, you know, because of Zoom meetings and a lot of email going back and forth, we've been able to proceed with all the administrative functions within graduate studies. Uh, the, the only place where we haven't been able to keep business going as usual is, of course, the research curtailment. Uh, we've, we've had to close all of the labs on campus, and of course that's had a major impact. Uh, but that's something that I'll let Dr. Lucas Bickler address as he, he's been involved with that. So other than that, um, it's been business as usual. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lucas. I think we will have some questions later on on the courses and those things. So I think that and, and Dr. Jacobi joined us again, so please go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the lovely benefits of internet, which is normally not so spotty where I am. Um, I was indicating that one of the additional needs for graduate students that, that's been identified is childcare support. So what we're working towards in collaboration with the health and safety team on campus, as well as research services, is to offer the equivalent of what is a summer camp for the groups that are coming back to campus for childcare needs. So that's still um, very well received by both levels, but has to pass through health and safety. So if that does happen, there will be childcare opportunities for graduate students, staff and faculty as they return to campus for the months of June and July. So that's a really positive and um, upcoming, hopefully, activity that we'll be able to support. Like I said, it's contingent upon health and safety. Um, other elements that I just wanted to address, and I briefly heard the, um, Dr. Klukas speak to the success we've had with online examinations, both for dissertations, thesis, as well as comprehensives. And with respect to the former, in the next coming weeks, we'll be opening up the presentation portion of thesis examinations and dissertations to the public through invited invitations. Um, so there'll be a registration, if you will, just to ensure that the room is closed to the general public to prevent safety of those that are in attendance from, I'm certain many of you heard of Zoom bombing. So we're working towards having um, public elements. The other elements, um, that I want to encourage people to consider moving forward is as we go towards online courses in the fall to work with your instructors and your supervisors, whether they're those that you're TAing for or taking courses from, and you discuss how the learning is not only going to occur with those individuals, but in addition to that, through the Center for Scholarly Teaching, the library and COGS will be posting videos that you can go learn from in short clips on how to better your online learning opportunities so that your degree progression can be better assisted through knowledge that you have. So those are some upcoming things that we have available for you. I think I'm going to leave it there and then if there's specific questions afterwards, I'm happy to address those moving forward. Thank Thanks, you. Jen. Uh, and, and I encourage everyone to keep uh, add, adding their questions there. We will address them once we finish that, uh, this uh, roundup first. So I will ask uh, Dr. C. Uh, Teller to talk a little bit about MENCH, uh, and then we'll move to uh, Dr. Bickler after that. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. Very good. Um, so I'll be quite brief as well. Uh, the MENCH program has continued uh, throughout the crisis and um, it has been uh, relatively successful. The biggest question really, I think, is for incoming MENCH students, but that's probably not the audience here because you are 
in all likelihood mostly here. So the only important thing is the courses that have been planned are go still going to be held. And unfortunately though, they are likely going to be mostly online. And that's probably the most important thing for the MH students here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rudy. I I'm sure there will be some question related to the course based students later on. So we'll okay. try to address them at that time. So uh, let's move on to Dr. Bickler, uh, talk a little bit about research and access to the labs. Uh, what is the plan? Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I just see in the chat that the very first question of the day was, when can grad students get back to carrying out on-campus experimental research? So that's absolutely one of the biggest priorities. And uh, for those who remember back in March, it was very sudden when the university decided to shut down research, experimental research. And really the biggest motivation was to make sure that everybody is safe until or unless we are able to somehow understand what COVID is and uh, how we can mitigate the risk. And so for, I would say, a couple of weeks, the university was waiting for instruction for various, from various agencies, government agencies, and working together with, for example, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, the Center for Disease Control, as well as for example, WorkSafe BC, which comes up with protocols and procedures about how do we establish a workplace which is safe for everybody. And so uh, I believe that at this point, uh, basically from the middle of May until let's say this week, uh, there is now a framework. And this framework would be the, if I can call it a big umbrella uh, guideline or policy that the university has prepared and is developing. What will happen next is that each faculty, and of course we belong to the Faculty of Applied Science. Lucas, can you speak a little bit louder? Uh, I think that we sometimes miss you, yeah. Okay, yeah. and then, uh, yeah. then uh, each department, so each faculty and each department will also prepare their own safety protocols and guidelines on how do we deal with uh, research coming back and uh, students coming back to, uh, to the labs. So at this point, uh, there are essentially three phases. Right now, we are in phase zero, which is there is no research being done. And it's expected that essentially from next week, phase one will begin. And phase one, what that means is that approximately 30% of building occupants would be able to come back. And unfortunately for us, it doesn't mean 30% of grad students because that 30% number includes the administrative staff, the uh, technicians, the cleaning services, facilities, etc. And so it's, it takes a little bit of coordination to decide on how many students will be able to come back. But really the underlying idea is that your supervisors will be told how many students are able to come back to a specific room. Um, Unfortunately, if it was before COVID, let's say 10 students in a room, um, after COVID or let's say from next week or the following uh, week, it's gonna be maybe two or three students who can be in the room at the same time. Uh, there will be some changes uh, to the way the labs are run. Obviously, we have to follow the guidelines uh, of the health authorities to maintain social distancing, to maintain or to ensure proper sanitation of, of equipment um, and to really try to minimize the risk of any transmission or uh, contamination. Um, the priority of determining you know, which students will be coming back uh, really revolves around a few key points. Uh, as Dr. Sadiq mentioned, one point is definitely the industrial participation in projects and the ability for investment or funding to flow to the university so that we can keep paying students. The other consideration, of course, is students who are very close to finishing their degree. And so those students will be given priority so that they can wrap up their research and move on and, uh, and graduate. The, as I said, there are some challenges which the university is at this point trying to uh, figure out. Some of them are the, the typical ones that you would see on television, you know, much like healthcare workers need 
proper personal protective equipment, uh, similar restrictions will be uh, on, on our campus. And so we have to make sure that there is proper um, being it gloves for experimentalists, or if somebody would need a respirator or a face mask, all of these uh, tools and instruments or supplies need to be uh, properly secured. So maybe I'll stop here and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much, uh, everyone. I think we just set the stage here. And uh, I think, uh, Lucas, you already answered one of the question about the access uh, in terms of, we, I see there's, so I will read the question I will, uh, and I will suggest a potential uh, person who can answer this question. If I have to address this question, I'll be happy to. Please, but please jump in if you think that you have something to add. So the first question is related to, if you see in the, in the Q&A, related to 2020 winter course list is not yet available on the course schedule for UBC of Nagan campus. I was wondering as to when and what would be available. Maybe this question goes to Dr. Klukas. Uh, yeah, I don't know the exact answer. Um, I do know that uh, the, the, the uh, School of Engineering staff just recently polled faculty members about their courses and the way they were going to deliver them given the fact that most of them will be online. Uh, and I think that information was then going to be passed on to enrollment services. Uh, so I, I, think, I think our list of, of courses has been sent or will be sent to enrollment services very soon who do the scheduling. So I suspect it'll be sometime, sometime in the first half of June. I don't know if that is the uh, typical, if that's when, when it's been done in previous years. Uh, I'm wondering if Shannon, if she has any more information about that, but that's all I know. Um, it's a little bit later than usual this year, um, specifically because I believe it took a, uh, it's a bit more challenging for the undergraduate program because we have so many undergraduate classes, they need to get scheduled first uh, to, to make sure that they're not conflicting with graduate courses. So normally we would have the courses done by almost a month now, but that's okay. It, I would assume that they would try very hard to get the classes up online by the time that students can see um, that they can register for courses in their in their SSC account, in their Student Service Center account. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, is there anything, uh, uh, Jennifer, in general on the, on the university level, uh, at the campus level, you would like to add on it? No, I think it was covered very accurately. It should be coming out very shortly. There's been a number of reasons for delays, inclusive of the international students here, will gain an appreciation for. We've also considered time zones in this year's planning a little bit for the courses that have historically tried to have a, and have generally had a high number of international students. We're looking at ways to move those potentially into more appropriate time zones than let's say late afternoon, which in many other places in the world would be the middle of the night, and also looked at things like asynchronous and synchronous learning. So students rest assured that the university is doing everything they can to build a really um, robust and flexible schedule, but that does take time. So, it, but Richard's, uh, Dr. Klukas is absolutely correct. About the next two weeks, we should see something for the first term. Thank you, Jen. So the next question is, thanks for the meeting. Will the circumstances affect any of the admissions? So I will try and uh, maybe then maybe I would see Jennifer can answer this question as well. So definitely, you know, one of the things which we have done, if you remember that uh, when we, in this March, uh, when this whole situation were uh, uh, developing, we allowed students who are new students coming in May, we allowed them to, to uh, uh, defer their admission for September. Uh, that what happened already. So, uh, but there were some students who were already at that time in Canada. So we let them join as well. So we were very flexible. So it is happening between, uh, at the, my understanding is that because based on my own personal experience with one student, uh, we are allowing students, we are trying to be flexible. Uh, we are allowing students to, if they want to postpone their, or, or sort of defer their, their admission to another semester or so, we are trying to do it. There will be an impact, you know, but these are impacts are not only from our point of view, this also from the, especially in our case where 80 to 90% are international students. There are lots of international travel restrictions. So we, so it's a very complicated issue. It's not just that we are not ready to accept that students. The challenge is whether these students can really make it. In many cases, 
uh, the research is like the, uh, uh, the expected research from the students is that they need to be in the lab. So professors might make different decision as compared to the professor whose research is mainly on the computational side. The students doesn't need a lab. He or she just needs a computer. That might be very different. So there's not a, one single answer to this question, but I will let uh, Dr. Jacobi to answer this question uh, that what's going on in COGS overall. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Sadiq is correct in that we're um, allowing deferral of offers um, up until one year. Uh, the admissions overall across campus are, and the acceptance of the admission offers are up 18%. So we do have an expected increase in enrollment for the fall. Now what we can account for is the challenges that COVID might bring to individuals this summer, both from the perspective of a personal issue at home maybe changing some of their um, long-term career trajectory or even um, immigration status. So we are doing our best to offer options for those groups of students, such as the online learning, and that's one of the greatest benefits of. But we are expecting as large of a cohort as we are in the past, and things are looking very good for UBCO. Thank you, Jan and Richard. So next question is, I think this is for uh, Lucas. How do we get access share to share research facility facilities like NMR and SEM? Uh, it is vital that we can get access to these facilities in order to make a progress and, uh, and graduate in time. Yep. Uh, thank you for the question. So these facilities are not necessarily under the control of the School of Engineering. And so really all we can do is just to wait for the procedures and protocols which these facilities will come up with. And so, um, for example, for the SCM, you know, again, there are discussions about uh, safety uh, and protect protection of individual users. And basically the users will have to clean up the uh, contact surfaces on the instrument before and after using the instrument. And so this needs to be worked out by the appropriate departments who oversee the infrastructure. And uh, once they, you know, basically open for business, then we will be able to start scheduling uh, use on these machines and instruments. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next question is a very specific question with uh, some student who's Dr. Uh, Ki Kang's student, uh, who already left to Calgary, and he works in a lab where three groups are working right now. I'm not sure how it's gonna work. Maybe Rich, uh, Lucas, you can talk about yep. shared facilities. I think that's a question related to shared facilities. So approximately two thirds of the labs that we have in the school are actually shared facilities or shared rooms. And the 30% number that I mentioned earlier is really per room, right? And so what the School of Engineering committees are working on is to say that at a given time, there's gonna be X number of students who are permitted to be in a shared room or in a room. And then the supervisors and School of Engineering administration will come up with which supervisors will have access to the room on which day. So for example, if there's two supervisors or two uh, researchers, uh, everybody will get, or first group will be there on Monday, Tuesday and half of Wednesday. And the second research group will be there, let's say half of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay, so uh, these procedures are still being worked out. And once we get the green light from the administration that we can start bringing students back into the labs, then your supervisors will be able to give you information on when you are able to uh, resume research. Thanks, Lucas. So the next question is uh, very specific to MN students who are more concerned about the graduate courses. The question is related to the possibility of adding new courses, especially in the area of civil and structural engineering. I'll try to answer this question. And then I'll ask Dr. Plukas to add. So the question is whether we can, uh, we have a room to offer more summer courses. I understand we are already in term one, we are talking about term two. Yes, I would say yes, we have a potential to add course if we have enough number of students. Uh, in the past, we have done it. And especially in the current circumstances where people are doing online teaching, from other universities we have done uh, in the past and using visiting professors to do that for graduate courses. It is a possibility. So my recommendation to the group will be if there are enough students, you can reach out to Dr. Klukas. If the need is there, I'll be very happy to provide resources and making sure that courses are, additional courses are offered in summer. So maybe Dr. Klukas, you wanna add something here? 
Uh, all I can add is that uh, there is one course that has been proposed by one of the civil engineering faculty members uh, in term two, and, and it is in structural engineering. I think it has something to do with seals, uh, steel structures, but uh, it, it, it's only a proposal right now to have a guest lecturer or a guest instructor give that course. Uh, it hasn't been finalized yet. We're still working through the details, but that's, that's one that I know that is in the works and could possibly be available for the second term. Yeah, and I will recommend that if there's enough interest, they can reach out. So Dr. Klukas needs to know how many students are interested in this kind of course, because we can only offer that course there are a certain number of students are interested. Otherwise, it's too expensive. Uh, Dr. Jacobi, please. Yes, beyond the opportunities here on the Okanagan campus and looking at the Q&A, um, work with your supervisors as well as your program coordinators to understand your course requirements because there is the opportunity, especially now that we're online, geography is not a problem. You don't need to travel to Vancouver, that you can take courses through Vancouver. There is a special permission required. The other element that you might wanna bring to your attention and your supervisor's attention is there's something called the Western, um, Canadian Western Deans Agreement, which means if you're a UBCO student, so fully registered here, you can take a course anywhere in Western Canada without paying fees, as long as your fees have been assessed and paid here. So work with your supervisor to understand the other options that are out there. And now with online learning, you could potentially take courses from Manitoba all the way to, you know, the other edge of Canada on the Pacific Ocean. So we're talking from, you know, University of Manitoba all the way to the University of Victoria. So look broadly and widely now that online learning is available to you. Thank Can you. I add something to this too, Rehan? Just yeah, in please. terms of this course that um, has been proposed by our by the structural faculty member, I did send out an email to all graduate students saying, if you are interested in this course, and I sent out the syllabus as well, to please email me back because I am I am uh, taking a tally of the students who are who are interested to see if we can meet that uh, threshold that you're looking for. Perfect. This is great. So please, the student who opposed, uh, asked this question, please make sure that uh, your voice is being heard by Shannon as well. Thank you very much. So the next question is, uh, it's a Jennifer question. Is, is UBC or taking any measures with regard to cutting down the tuition fees for upcoming term, given that on-campus activities has, have become limited? We're working very hard to find some type of accommodation for students relative to tuition fees and ancillary fees. Um, many of this is bigger than even UBC. It, it resonates back to the government level and how funding is done within BC and Canada. So graduate and postdoctoral studies in Vancouver, College of Graduate Studies, the deans across both campuses, we continue to advocate to senior administration and the government for some changes. At the present moment in time, there's no information to update on that, but we will continue to work for your best interest with respect to tuition. But at the moment, Tuition fees are not due until the middle of June, which is about seven weeks later than normal. But at the moment, they have been assessed. Yeah, I think just a related thing, which I would like to bring it here, which I didn't mention earlier. There are some uh, possibility for the students who's, for, who are funded by some industrial partners and somehow they are affected. Their partners are not there anymore and the professors don't have a funding. There's a new funding uh, uh, which is available to the supervisors. Uh, who are providing this funding to the students. So this is a new program. Maybe, uh, Lucas, do you have a little bit idea? Can you talk about that uh, 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 scenario in which the industry partner disappears and students in the end of the day not getting funding? And uh, how? what is the process on that? Um, so the one that I'm aware of is, for example, related to my tax funding. And so my tax as an agency has made an uh, offer to the university that they would be able to provide some financial support. It is a more of a bursary type of a financial support. Uh, it may not be a long-term uh, type of a funding uh, solution. Uh, however, in short term, there might be some financial opportunities and we're just waiting for the final, uh, I guess, version of what are the guidelines and eligibility criteria for for the my tax funding thanks lucas yeah. so the next question is uh, will the student be notified when they should get back to the lab should we connect the supervisor about that lucas again for you yeah it would be your supervisor who would know what the limitations are on a given workspace or uh, on a given lab space and so please do keep in touch with your supervisors and they'll provide you with guidance 
so next question is what is the administrative process forms etc in order to get back to experimental research again lucas i think it's your question you are very popular today which one which was the question uh, uh, about the administrative process to get uh, get to the labs what kind of forms we need to create or what are we trying to do here okay so so the procedure would essentially involve doing a risk assessment uh, so that the procedure and the type of research or the research activity would be described not necessarily in scientific terms but in terms of risk of transmitting or uh, uh, coming into contact with somebody who might have an infection and then developing the protocols and procedures that would ensure that there is no risk of transmission. So uh, your faculty members or your supervisors will be given these procedures. Uh, they will be working with the School of Engineering Sa uh, Safety uh, leads and the technical team. And um, I would imagine that with you uh, as grad students as well, and once that is finalized, the forms will be submitted to the School of Engineering uh, Research uh, Resumption Committee, which will review the documents. And if everything is okay, then a permission would be granted to uh, bring students back into the lab. Thanks, Lucas. So the next question is, thank you very much for uh, answering the questions. Uh, as you mentioned that most of the classes will be online. So could we attend registered online classes at the Vancouver campus? Maybe Jennifer, you can answer this question. Yeah, absolutely. As indicated, you can register for classes on the Vancouver campus. There's a, a process that you have to go through. Um, the first thing, if you're looking at courses on the Vancouver campus is talk to your supervisor, ensure that meets your academic progress plan. And then after that, if you work with the program coordinators and the program assistants, they'll be able to intersect with Vancouver and determine the best um, steps forward to get you registered in those courses. So absolutely, Okanagan students can take uh, courses in the Vancouver campus and vice versa, and as mentioned earlier, across Western Canada. Okay, the next question is again for you, Jennifer. Is there any possibility of summer tuition waiver to graduate students? At the present point, moment in time, I don't have any additional information on that, but we'll continue to work for you to find some type of relief. We definitely hear what you're saying. And as of right now, we're just working on your behalf and hopefully we'll have some positive updates in the near future. Thank you, Jennifer. The next question is, will the COVID pandemic extend the study period 36 to 48 months for PhD students, especially experimental based research? I think that one's mine. <laughs> um, just, uh, I'm a little bit confused confused on this question. So the time to completion at UBC for all PhD students is 48 months. Yeah. I'm wondering if the study period might be something within an individual's visa. If that is the case, I would suggest you reach out to IPS, which is the International Program and Services unit here, and they can directly provide visa guidance for you. Um, they are the experts in that realm. But time to completion at UBC Okanagan for all PhD students is minimum of 48 months on paper. Thank you. Could uh, I, could I uh, maybe comment that perhaps the question was referring to uh, time to achieve candidacy? Maybe, maybe. If it was time to achieve candidacy, that's another question on the 36 months. Thanks, Richard. Absolutely. We can extend time to candidacy. Um, we just need to hear from the student via the supervisor, and I believe that paperwork is also signed off between Dr. Klukas and sent through Shannon. So absolutely, time to um, comprehensives or candidacy can be extended as well. And I would say too, sorry to interject, that um, for PhD students, they have technically six years to complete because if you go reach the six year mark, that's when students need to submit a form requesting an extension to complete their program. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Thank you. So next question, I think it's a very important question. Hello, Professor, are you planning to write any safety training online or offline to research students before allowing students to, to go back in, into the labs as safety is our first priority? I think, absolutely. I think this is a really important point and uh, it's a very good idea, actually. I think I, I highly encourage Dr. Uh, Bickler to think about it. When we are sending our students back in labs, we should be conducting some kind of safety, working with uh, Alex uh, group in our labs, making sure that all the students should have that information. Maybe I'll let you speak and talk a little bit about it. 
Right. So the answer is yes, there will be additional safety training and orientation. And for those students who have access to labs, you may remember that before you were granted access, that there was a form, a School of Engineering form that needed to be filled out with the various training orientations, uh, work alone policy, biosafety, um, radioisotope safety, laser safety, and so on. And so we will be adding another category to this. And it essentially deals with um, um, not using medical terms, but you know, uh, virus or virology and uh, immune uh, system training so that there again is that uh, health and safety awareness of how do we deal with uh, transmitted uh, diseases. Thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, next question is uh, maybe I think it's a con quite complex question. I will let uh, Dr. Lucas to answer. For continuing students, how can a student whose supervisor is no longer on campus and has a co supervisor in another department, not engineering, be considered for UGF? My understanding of this question is that student is an engineering student. Uh, it's not an engineering student, it, but his co-supervisor was in engineering. That's my understanding. Because if you, a uh, student should belong to the department where their main supervisor is. That's what my understanding is. Richard, how do you are interpreting this question and please try to answer. Uh, I'm interpreting this question as a student whose supervisor used to be at UBC and is no longer at UBC, but who is still the principal supervisor. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is a very specific case. Um, and rather than talk about it here, I would encourage that individual to email me directly. Yeah, I appreciate it. I think this is the right uh, response. But one thing is that my overall uh, statement on that one, that of whatever decisions we should make for UGFs and this funding, it should be keeping students, uh, uh, it should be student centric, let me put it this way. We should make sure that it is about student and that students should not be deprived of their, uh, of their uh, you know, these opportunities because their supervisor left or something. So this is in general, I would say, but this is a decision lies to the committee and Dr. Lucas, how they're going to address this issue. Okay, next question is, uh, uh, when will the supervisor be known about when the students can go back to the lab? Dr. Bickler mentioned that 30% can go back to next week. Should we wait until the inter uh, instruction uh, has been sent to the supervisor or we would directly start working from June 1st with 30% lab activity? So, uh, Lucas, you have to, uh, you know, kind of uh, clearly define the expectations I, yeah. here. I'll just clarify this. So the 30% and the coming back uh, from next week, of course, it depends on the university granting uh, um, permission to the School of Engineering to implement the protocols and guidelines that we at the School of Engineering have developed. So uh, please do not show up in the lab on uh, you know, June 1 or next week. Uh, you will hear from your supervisor once, let's say, the shared facility or single user facility has been given the green light. Um, but at this point, it seems that the first week of June is when the School of Engineering professors will be able to uh, apply for regaining access to the labs. And if the approval process within the school takes another, let's say, two or three days, then it's potentially the second week of June when you physically can come uh, back to the labs. But again, please do not show up in the labs. Uh, please stay in touch with your supervisors and only when they give you the green light, only then uh, you should be coming back. Thank you, Lucas. The next question is, uh, I have applied for Cox bursary, but I have not heard back. Is it still going or it is canceled? Maybe Jen, you can answer this question. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there is a, a lag between the time of processing and the adjudication. As you can um, appreciate, there's a lot of applications. So it is still open. Um, the money is still available. And you will be getting a response with respect to whether you were successful in the bursary or didn't achieve um, the minimum need of um, students. So yes, it is still open and available. Just a clarification, it's not a College of Graduate Studies bursary. It's a UBC Okanagan bursary that's being adjudicated through enrollment services on par with their standard bursaries. So there's um, support available for you and it's still open. Okay, thank you very much, Jen. Um, so next question is, uh, uh, how about self-funded research students? 
and and student saying he's lost 2.5 months and my degree will extend because of this without any fault i will pay fee for extra term this would be some uh, help for self-funded students at least so jen maybe can you talk about the bursary available opportunities available for this kind of students yeah for all students whether you're self-funded or not the bursary through the sisc system i encourage you to apply for it um, it is available. The other element I can encourage students to look at is across campus. There are some additional funding opportunities and resources for employment becoming available. There'll be some made available through the faculty. There'll be additional ones made available through the Center for Teaching and Learning, as well as potentially through scholarly and writing centers. So keep your eyes open on the job board at UBC through um, enrollment services because there are additional um, monies available for work employment as well. Thank you. So what is this? Uh, the next question is, what is the summer tuition fee refund eligibility criteria for grad students who completed their MSc programs requirement on mid-May 2020? That is a very specific question with a calculation that's done through enrollment services and I don't have the specific data on that. Um, what we are looking for is on the impact of COVID on students that did have a minor delay and trying to make adjustments for that. So if this student could please email me and CC your supervisor on that, I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you. So Jennifer, you can read the next question is directly addressing you. Said so you mentioned something and uh, to take courses in Western, across Western Canada. So what is the best way to access that? Okay, um, thank you for this question. And this opportunity is really growing, um, especially in light of COVID. So if you look on a variety of different institutional websites, or if you have friends at other institutions, talk to them and find out what is available. Since this has blossomed in the past two weeks, we've even created a new form, um, which allows all signatures to be gained remotely and online. This will be updated on the COGS website within the next 48 hours. I literally just saw the form this morning and it was approved at noon. And then in addition to the form, what we're hoping to gather is across all institutions, the courses that are available this summer, as well as this fall. Now, as you can appreciate, UBCO still don't have their courses up for the fall. So there's a little bit of a lag. So I do encourage all students to watch the website regularly. And like I said, some of your best resources is often your supervisor, as well as other students at other institutions. So if you can reach out that way, and we'll do our best to put an update on the COGS website. Thanks, Jen. So next question, uh, Richard, if you could see the, uh, it's a long question, you should read it. I think maybe you are in the best position to answer this question. This is mainly around for the TA, Richard. So I can just start if you want, and then maybe you can. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, don't, I don't see which one you're talking. How do you plan on upholding academic integrity in, uh, in, in course? Uh, the student TA last semester, they see a lot of uh, students are caught plagiarizing or they're talking to, uh, they are collaborating with each other. So, and, and grad inflation was huge in many ENGR courses. I understand this is mainly around undergrad courses. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't see the question. Is this in the chat? The top question on the, on the Q and A. Richard, Richard, it's not in the chat. I believe what Rayhan is referring to is it's the Q and A button on the bottom. That's where I'm looking. Oh, maybe I'm in the wrong tab. I'm sorry. I was in the wrong tab, the open tab. Oh, I see it now. One second. Yeah, this is, this is definitely a concern. And yes, this, uh, this has to do with undergrad courses. Um, last term, um, because basically faculty members had uh, one weekend to convert their courses to online format. And so I, I think it's fair to say that, you know, that, that meant that not, not every course um, you know, academic integrity could be protected to the degree that we would like. Uh, in the fall, we, we now know and have known for quite a while now that all of the courses, undergrad courses in the fall, will be taught online. 
And uh, so professors have a lot more time now to prepare. And I'm sure that uh, professors who taught last term online are making some adjustments in light of, you know, academic integrity. Uh, we had our School of Engineering uh, retreat just uh, two days ago and a major session in the retreat was online teaching. Uh, a lot of resources are coming to light and, and uh, faculty are taking advantage of those. So I, th I think the general answer to this question is that faculty have far more time to prepare for the fall courses and they have more resources available to them now to um, address these issues of academic integrity. Yeah, and just to add on that, that we have uh, started a study with, with one of our communication professor on uh, the learning the best practices uh, in terms of uh, reducing uh, these plagiarism issues and on, on especially related to online teaching. And um, so we will try to come up with the best practices for our professors to making sure that at I don't know whether we can 100% uh, uh, can control this thing, but definitely our idea is to minimize it. So that those best practices will be available soon for our professors. So that making sure that uh, we create uh, like a smooth process for uh, fall semester. Uh, I think this question is Lucas for you. Uh, would you open research lab for 24 hours a day? Yeah. I would be happy to be working at 4 a.m. in the lab. It means getting more access. I also know another student in my lab who would be happy to work at the same time for safety reasons. Um, I appreciate the question and the follow-up question also regarding the working in shifts. Uh, those two questions are similar. Uh, the During the phase one, which is what we are just about to enter, uh, a lot of the research uh, activities on campus uh, will be actually directed by uh, campus facilities and unfortunately the cleaning services on campus work from essentially 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. and so the university would not give us permission at this point during phase one uh, to be working outside of these regular business hours. Um, from July, so let's say one month later, if the health or the, if the statistics for infections keep decreasing, then there's a high chance that so-called phase two will begin. And at that point, instead of 30% building load, there's a chance that there will be 60% building load. Uh, and as a result, I think that there's gonna be a bit more flexibility with students coming back and maybe working even before or after the 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, time shift. So at this point, uh, unfortunately, no shifts during phase one, but it is something that uh, the university is looking into for phase two. Yeah, so thank you very much, uh, Lucas. Uh, I think we are already reached our time. Uh, there are one question, maybe Lucas, you can should address. I think it's a very important question about the COVID-19 screening facility. Can you answer uh, to the question, then we could wrap it up. Very quickly, at this point, there will not be a screening facility on campus. Um, there are some facilities in town, but uh, as far as I know, not, not on our campus. Yeah. Okay. The last question is related with upcoming winter term. Uh, I think one, th quest one thing I told in the, uh, in the introduction that our idea is to increase the capacity, in, uh, in, uh, increase the TA hours in one way or another. It will be different than what we do in a normal circumstances, but I will ensure that, that we have enough TAs available for our students. In general, I would say that. But what will be the right format? Uh, I think that uh, Dr. Hurfar is not here. I, I wish you could have talked about it. But if you have any specific question related with that, please send me or Dr. Hurfar or Dr. Zhang Kao that email and we'll try to address that. So at this point, I would like to say thank you to all the panelists for answering the questions. I think it was an excellent opportunity for our students to uh, uh, raise their voice and their, raise their concerns, what we see. And I find this uh, is really helpful. And um, uh, it's, I think uh, it's a very good platform. Even we have to do on a monthly basis, this kind of things. And you know, I, I'm sure all my panelists will agree with me that they will be happy to come and, and give an update on that because things are changing very quickly. So uh, you might have different question in a month's time. So thank you very much, uh, all the participants, all the panelists, and also my special thanks to Shannon and Sam, who did an excellent job to conduct this session. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. Please stay safe and healthy. 
and please give us your your feedback please don't be shy in sending your feedback to us so thank you very much take care bye